Hello and welcome Hello. to our 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House Trail Dedication. I'm Dave. Yay! Yay. <laughs> I'm Dave Brunix, and I will be kind of leading the ceremony for the most part. I'll give you a little bit of a background on the nature trail to start things off. The trail itself runs from the corner of this building through the woods and down to the far end of the field on your left. When we're finished with our presentation, you'll have the opportunity to go for a walk with me on that. Where did the trail start? Uh, my mom. I think better than anything. She, very nature-orientated, outdoors, spiritual person, and she felt that the museum needed that aspect brought to it. And so she had been pushing at it for quite a while. This is the sign that is at the head of the trail. And what she had made on the sign for it was the 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House Museum, an intense, intensified witness for peace, introducing our newly evolving project Stillwaters, which includes a walk of freedom trail and a peace park called Serenity. All are welcome to enjoy. It will be an amazing celebration of hope when completed because it already is. So we got where we were trying to figure out how we could create a trail or something along those lines. And one day I decided I'd just take a walk through the hedgerow down there and see what I could do. And I realized that unfortunately the emerald ash borer had killed a lot of the ash trees that were there. And as I walked through the dead ash trees, I realized they were about the width of the bucket on my tractor. So I kind of got a sense of where to go with it. Took down the various ash trees in front of my tractor, cleared a trail. A friend of mine, Kevin Holtz, owns a tree service, which is unlimited wood chips. And so Kevin would bring the wood chips along and dump them along the trail. And then I brought them in onto the trail for a base. Prior to doing the construction of it, I needed to know where the property lines were. And I had found some iron stakes. So I went down to Lowe's and I bought a roll of string. And I tied it to the first iron stake until I found the next iron stake. And that was my high tech level of surveying that I used to get it. Once I had that done, Peter Inglesby and Dan Del Priori from the town came over and walked the trail with myself and some others, gave me some ideas, which I can share how those evolved when we get down to the trail, and gave me the go ahead to build a trail. And we went from there with it. Uh, I'm searching for my piece of paper. There we go. Outside of that, I think a lot of the information related to the trail itself would be almost better when we're down into there. I'll lead you on a walk through it and I'll show you various aspects of it. What I'd like to do now is introduce Peter Inglesby. He's the Farmington Town Supervisor. He's a 32 year resident of Farmington, a retired colonel in the New York Army National Guard for over 30 years, town service of 13 years on the Zoning Board of Appeals, eight years on the town board and now in his seventh year as town supervisor. He also serves on the Ontario County Public Works Committee and the Ways and Means Committee. Welcome Peter Inglesby. Thanks Dave. Hopefully I'll uh, talk a little less than my introduction. You know? <laughs> I've got you that, on for an was, hour. I kind of fed him that information, so. Um, also, you had mentioned Steve Holtz. Uh, he's my deputy supervisor. He's here tonight with his, or this afternoon with his three children. And Dan Delapuri is here. He's our, one of our senior code officers in the town. He's here to, today with his daughter, Gabby. I um, want to thank uh, the 1816 Meeting House Group for the invite. I want to welcome everybody here uh, to the Quaker Days celebration. It's this weekend, as you all know, it's not only here in Farmington, but it's been celebrated in nearby Macedon. And of course, we can also, while we're here, celebrate 
Father's Day to those that it pertains to, and June 19th, of course, Juneteenth. Um, remembering the past and creating the future slogan used by the 1816 Meeting House Committee is what this weekend is all about. I was lucky enough, I live right down the road, and I was here when this building was moved from its site to here, quite an accomplishment. I remember Lieutenant, then Lieutenant Governor Hochul visiting the site right here, and that was a great achievement for the organization, great celebration. Then we decided to side the building protect the outside, which was another great uh, ch achievement here to help save the building. And most recently, you see the, the ditch here, and that's for future electrical power run to the building. So another um, step forward in this building progress. And then today, as Dave mentioned, we have another exciting event and the dedication of the, of the new nature trail. Many had thought and desired to make this a reality, but as Dave said, a lot of the credit goes to his mom. And of course, Dave had a few helpers and thank you all for them. Uh, I invite you all to walk the trail if you can and enjoy the rest of the day. And I just uh, thank you again for the invite for everybody. There are a few other groups and individuals that have actually been a great help to us as we've gone through this. Take a moment and recognize a few of them. Peter mentioned our ditch. What we have right now is there actually is the conduit for our electricity buried under there. With the supply chain shortage, it's been very interesting getting the different materials. And out of everything we would have trouble getting, it's the actual fuse box. That and it kind of ties everything all together, but we, we actually have a shipping date finally after months. But Steve's father-in-law, the 1816 Holtz Meeting House, <laughs> Steve's father-in-law, Joe Pellerite, uh, works at O'Connell Electric and he was able to facilitate a donation from O'Connell Electric of the electrical supplies for this. Not going to go into the pricing of it, but it was a fairly nice, substantial donation. And Joe has been chasing their suppliers to make sure that we get all of the correct equipment in time to do everything. My nephew, Jacob Dice, showed up with his excavator dug us a trench and then filled it in so we could get back in through here. Uh, my friend Jerry Johnston and where is Maeve? Some, there you are. My friend Jerry and his child Maeve, Jerry's an electrician, they actually did the layout for us and they will be doing the installation of the electrical service. And we also have been working with Ewing Lettering and Graphics, and they will be doing the signs down on the trail, which we should have in the next, within the next few weeks, as well as replacing the sign down below. I should have the proofs for approval sometime this week, and we'll roll from there. And another nice aspect we had, I'm a retired school teacher from Williamson, and also very involved in auto racing. And one of my former students, in spite of his best, Mitchell Hyde, uh, I had him when he was in seventh and eighth, or just seventh? So I had him in seventh grade, and then kind of reestablished our connection through auto racing. We both work with the same team. And he was looking for a way to accomplish his Eagle Scout goals to, to get the title of it and I said oh I've got an idea for you and they came out and I showed him a bench that 
my dad had built in memory of my brother that's at our home. And Mitchell and his father Stephen and grandfather Ron were able to procure the equipment, the supplies. He has to organize a schedule, a work crew. Yep, blueprints and a work design on how it would flow as a process. And so for as is Eagle Scout project, when we walk the trail, you'll see there's eight benches down there. That, six. There's six benches down there. Six. Six benches down there. Really? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Okay. That uh, Mitchell was able to have built and built through his Eagle Scout stuff. So thank you, Mitchell. Yeah. So great. He didn't show up. Okay. You don't show up, you don't get noticed. <laughs> no, I didn't write his name down. Next on our agenda, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Judy Wellman for a brief talk on the Seneca Leaders and Quakers in 1816 Meeting House, yeah. June 17th through the 19th, 1840. Judith Wellman was one of the founding members of the 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House Museum and now serves as its president. She has done extensive research on this meeting house and its importance in equal rights for African Americans, women, and Native Americans. Seneca people and Quakers met here in June on 17th, June 17th through the 19th of 1840 to organize resistance to the federal government's attempt to move all Haudenosaunee people to what is now Kansas. Seneca people refused to go, and as part of their organized resistance, they asked for and received help from their Quaker allies. This nationally important movement meant that Haudenosaunee people were the single largest group of indigenous people east of the Mississippi to remain on any part of their native homelands. Judy will talk briefly about the efforts of the 1816 Farmington Meeting House to highlight this important national story. Welcome Judy Wellman. Thank you so much Dave, really good, good introduction, good program. Well, thank you. <laughs> we didn't want to let today pass because it is the very day, June 19th, that about eight Seneca leaders, two translators, and 16 Quaker leaders from Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, and Genesee yearly meetings met here in a major conference to devise a plan to get the federal government to forget sending Seneca and Haudenosaunee people west of the Mississippi. And they were semi-successful, which is what makes it so much more interesting. And this is one of the most important national stories relating to this meeting house. They met right in this meeting house that's so very little known. So we want to highlight it and we'll keep doing so for many years to come, I think. Um, in 1838, well, some of you may know about the Trail of Tears, where the Cherokee, the Creeks, the five civilized tribes of the Southeast were uh, made a treaty in 1836 with the federal government to go to Oklahoma. The summer of 1838, uh, the federal government sent them all on what was called the Trail of Tears. It was 8,000 people. The U.S. Army walked them to Oklahoma. Many died. The Seneca knew this was happening and said, we're not going. The federal government said, oh, this worked so well for the Cherokee, the Choctaw, the Creeks. We're going to come up and do it with the Haudenosaunee, which was a treaty of Buffalo Creek. What they failed to um, take into account was that Seneca people said, no, absolutely not. In 1838, um, there was a Genesee Yearly Meeting met here in June, which they always did annually. And it was a meeting that included Quakers from all over upstate New York, Michigan, Ontario, Canada. So it was 25 local meetings met here. And they started immediately a plan and they developed first what they call the Joint Committee on Indian Affairs. So they got Quakers from Baltimore, Philadelphia, New York, as well as Genesee to form this national committee of resistance. 
And then they went right to the top. They went to President Martin Van Buren. <laughs> and in a very polite way, as Quakers generally are, but very firm, this is one of the phrases in the letter they sent to him, to contemplate a forcible removal of the Indians and the heartrending scenes that must accompany such removal is shocking to every sentiment of justice and humanity. To see a great and powerful nation lending its aid to oppress the weak and helpless would do more to weaken the bond of our national union than all the enemies of a just people could ever affect. Um, and they began to a point in 1839, they, um, Martin Van Buren was impressed enough that he arranged a conference at Cattaraugus, a council, with Senecas, and the Quakers went to Cattaraugus in August. This joint committee in November appointed a man named Griffiths Cooper, who was an enrolled minister at this meeting house, as their agent. In January 1840, Griffiths Cooper um, held a, a conference with Senecas at Buffalo Creek. And what he did was say, what's the impact of this? Does anybody want to go or not? Who are the leaders that the federal government is claiming they have signed this treaty? He got 62 different statements from Seneca people. And the count was of 2,502 men and women Seneca people, they asked, do you want to go west? Do you want to stay? Only 146 of them said they wanted to go. Um, that made no difference at all to the Senate, which on April 4th passed the Treaty of Buffalo Creek. In spite of the opposition of the Senecas, the Quakers, a whole lot of other people, uh, Quakers went out and got petitions from communities all over this region against the treaty. Um, the Senate passed it uh, 15 to 15. The tie was broken by the Vice President, Richard Johnson. And so the treaty went into effect. That very same day, the Quakers from the Joint Committee said, we're going to publish everything we have and we know about this story. So they published, it was called The Case of the Seneca Indians, and it's online. And it's, it just knocks your socks off the kinds of things in Seneca people's voices that they were saying in opposition to going. It's just uh, uh, amazing. Um, in May 1840, the Senecas in council assembled said, whatever the consequences, we will in no event voluntarily remove to the country allotted to us west of the Mississippi. And on May 2nd, 1840, Tonawanda Seneca leaders drafted a petition to be sent here to Quakers at this meeting. And it said, we only ask for justice. We love Tonawanda. We have no wish to leave it. It's the land of our fathers. Here we wish to lay our bones in peace. Um, and so at the request of Seneca people, Quakers from the Joint Committee appointed 16 Quakers from all over the country to come here. They met with eight Seneca leaders and two um, interpreters, and probably more. Um, among them were, I'm going to say their names, um, Jacob Shango from Allegheny, Seneca White, Henry Two Guns, William Tony from Buffalo Creek, Samuel Gordon from Cattaraugus, and Peter Wilson was a Cayuga interpreter who lived at Buffalo Creek, and Cephas Two Guns was a Seneca interpreter. So they all met here. Seneca's presented their case, and we have Quakers if, are nothing if you're not good record keepers. They kept minutes of the meetings. And you have to understand the Senecas are speaking in Seneca, interpreted by Cayuga who speaks English in Seneca. So but what the Quakers got were the words as interpreted into English of the Seneca people who were presenting their case. And um, they came back here together and the Senecas gave them advice, which was to stay where you are, let's see what we can do. And by that time, in the fall of 1840, the election moved the federal government from the Democrats to the Whigs. And the Whig president, William Henry Harrison, you probably know, died after a month in office, but not before he had appointed John C. Spencer from Canandaigua, a lawyer from Canandaigua, to be the Secretary of War, who was in charge of um, Native and federal um, uh, <coughs> treaties and diplomats. And so with the help of Quakers, um, 
they negotiated what they call a supplemental treaty of 1842. And by that treaty, the um, Senecas kept uh, Allegheny and Cattaraugus. They lost Buffalo Creek, which is Buffalo, and Tonawanda. The Tonawanda Senecas made a separate deal and kept their land. That's why they're still there in 1857. But the deal seems to have been made by mostly member leaders of that joint committee that met in New York City. And they didn't seem to consult with Quakers here or with Seneca people. And so on, the, uh, Quakers here were horrified when they realized that Seneca people were going to have to leave two of those reservations, lose them. So they held a meeting here in this building on March 13, 1842. The very next day, women at the Tonawanda homeland sent a petition to Congress, which has been transcribed by M.J. Halsey and Mary K. Vallant and others, and is on our website. And it's sad, this is from the women clan mothers. We are astonished to hear that the Tonawanda reservation we have to give up. We, the women of the Tonawanda, have exerted our influence in trying to have our chiefs to be united in their mind in their councils and they have done so and not one of our chiefs has signed the treaty you may be astonished to hear from us they said as we've never done so send a petition before we think much and are attached to these places which the great spirit has given to his red children of the country um, in spite of that heartfelt plea, and we know it went to the president because there's a, a draft in the University of Rochester papers from Amy Post, who was a member of this meeting. We think the Quaker women helped Seneca women here draft that petition sent the next day after the meeting they had here. There's also a petition in the National Archives copied over, so it's not a draft. So we know it went. In spite of that, um, there was no budging the federal government, and Seneca leaders met uh, in council at Cattaraugus in May, early May, 1842, and they invited Quakers to come. Nearly all the chiefs of the nation were convened, said the, said the Quakers. After a free conference, the Indians were fully satisfied, friends took an affectionate leave, and returned home and Seneca leaders continued to meet for six more days. 79 of the 81 leaders at that co council agreed to the supplemental treaty of Buffalo Creek, even though it was really forced on them, but it did mean that at least they were here on some semblance of their homelands and the Tonawandas managed to keep their homelands. We have a picture somewhere of Jemmy Johnson, who was the head chief of, at Tonawanda. I think it's in the building if you wanna take a look at it. Um, this was going on at the very same time that Quakers were active in getting women's rights organized and especially abolitionism. The very same 1840 time period that the Senecas were meeting here, um, abolitionists from all over m met here in Farmington and formed the Western New York Anti-Slavery Society that became a real generative force for abolition of the abolition of slavery all over the country. And Griffiths Cooper, who was active as the agent for the Seneca, was also very active as one of these abolitionists. And he connected the two movements. He said, we've struggled for four years to relieve our red brethren. We've circulated petitions to be signed as well out of the society as in it. We asked and received names for those petitions from all kinds of religious and political parties, civil and military officers. We pulled the wires and these world's people danced to them. Now friends, what was all this for? Why for the very thing abolitionists are now pleading for, namely universal rights to all men. He would probably say women too. And Quakers took that call to heart and became a, a major influence in generating abolitionist activity. And then women's rights activity the second largest group of people who went to the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention in 1848 were Quakers affiliated with this meeting house and they helped organize the first women's rights convention in the country. I'm done, but <laughs> not with the project. We're starting a transcription project, which Donna Hill Herendine said she'd help with. We have lots of manuscripts from Swarthmore College mostly relating, kept by this Joint Committee on Indian Affairs, 
and we're going to be transcribing some of them and if you'd like to help do not hesitate to volunteer we're setting up an advisory committee that's about half Seneca people and half archivists and we'd like to get them out to the public so that there's more awareness of how important this movement was and what happened here at this meeting house thank you so much for coming today part of the trail starts. Originally this was much steeper and I thought it might be difficult for people to walk up and down. So then I cut this one in that was a little more gradual. Come on down here you can see the first of the benches Mitchell built. The chips you're walking on right now were just placed uh, yesterday. The idea of the benches is to just be able to sit. Will this be the permanent placement of this one? I don't really know yet seemed like a nice place where you can kind of look down. I thought it was a nice view. Uh, if anyone does have a person looking to complete an Eagle Scout project or otherwise, there are a couple other projects related to this and other aspects where I could work with a potential Eagle Scout as well. And what you're going to find along the trail in five different areas are what we call a little peninsula here. And Pete had suggested Put a bench on them, and it'd be a nice place to sit, contemplate, things along those lines. I've been working with Ewing Lettering and Graphics out of Farmington, and what we have are a series of quotes, two from Quakers, two from Native Americans, two for abolition, African American history, and two for women's rights. And there will be a series of signs on the trail with different quotes related to the meeting house and the different uh, issues that they work towards resolving. And again, these are the benches that Mitchell built. <laughs> she just wants, she wants a little love. Well, then she's going to get some. <laughs>